All right, hello and welcome back everyone for more human physiology. So next on our agenda, we are going to start looking at epithelial tissue. So our discussion on this is going to be a little bit more involved than our discussions were on nervous tissue and muscle tissue because there's not exactly a chapter dedicated to either epithelial tissue or connective tissue. So our discussions here are going to be a little bit more involved. So we've already mentioned that epithelial cells will organize themselves into flat sheets and usually the purpose here is to compartmentalize the body or to shield the body away from the external environment. Obviously we've talked about why that might be important for homeostasis. The places where you might find epithelial tissue includes but is not limited to the skin, the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, the urinary and reproductive system. So we're going to see epithelial cells in a lot of different places, and those are just some examples. So in this picture you're looking at here, you can see several different layers of the skin, and there are epithelial cells at all levels. So another way that you can find epithelial cells, in addition to what we've already talked about, the word epithelial, the, the epi part of that, refers to an outside structure. So these are going to be the types of places where you find epithelia that basically shield the internal body cavities away from the air or whatever is outside in the environment. You can find epithelial cells more internally and they manifest themselves as what are called endothelial cells. The main place you're going to find endothelial cells will be in the walls of blood vessels. So if you consider a blood vessel as being kind of a hollow tube, the endothelial cells basically form the tube itself and form the wall of that particular vessel. So one of the major, major, major concepts that we want to make sure we discuss when talking about epithelial cells is as opposed to most other cells, epithelial cells are what we call polarized. So when you hear the word polarization, you probably are thinking of something like a magnet. So based on what you know, what does it mean for a magnet to be polarized? You're probably thinking, okay, well, a magnet has a south pole and a north pole, and they have different magnetic properties that allow one to attract each other and then similar poles to repel each other. Well, it's kind of the same way for a cell to be polarized. Now, cells don't attract each other or, polar or uh, repel each other based on their polarization. Really, the thing we want to focus on here is that they have two different ends that are distinct from each other. These two ends are called the apical membrane, which is on top, and the basolateral membrane, which is on the bottom. You may recall these terms from chapter 3 when we discussed intestinal glucose absorption through the intestinal uh, epithelia. So apical membrane on top and basolateral membrane on the bottom. So again, this picture will probably look familiar to you if you recall back to chapter 3 in our discussion on glucose reabsorption. Uh, so the property of the apical membrane is that it always tends to face towards the lumen of a particular organ or structure. So basically when we say the word lumen, we mean kind of the hollow portion of it. So for example, it's going to be where you find the stuff that is contained within a particular organ or structure. For the stomach and the intestines, the lumen is going to be where you find the stomach acid or the partially digested food. It's going to be everything inside that particular organ or structure. For a blood vessel, the lumen is going to contain the blood. So the lumen is the innermost portion, kind of a hollowed out portion of a particular organ or structure. So the apical membrane, you will notice here before we move on to the basolateral membrane, the apical membrane is almost always forming these microvilli, which are there to increase the surface area, to increase the efficacy and speed of membrane transport. So uh, we talked in chapter uh, three when we talked about all the different passive and uh, active membrane transport processes increasing your surface area will make those processes go much faster. So having a strong uh, concentration gradient will speed it up. Having an, an increased surface area will do it up. A temperature increase will do it, and that's about it. The basolateral membrane is going to be uh, directed towards the extracellular fluid. So if you consider a layer of epithelia as being kind of a straight line like that, 
on top here is going to be the lumen, and then on the bottom is going to be all the extracellular fluids, including both the interstitial fluid and the blood plasma itself. So if you have a network of capillaries, they will be beneath the layer of epithelia on the basolateral side. So the basolateral membrane of this particular epithelial cell is sitting down on a structure called the basement membrane or the basal laminas. And there are connections here that keeps the epithelia anchored down nice and tight so that they don't basically float away or get pulled away. So a fun fact that we can kind of uh, make a connection back to chapter three, that sodium potassium pump that we discussed and how important it is in maintaining sodium and potassium gradients for the sake of secondary active transport, that pump is always found on the basolateral membrane. So you may want to go back to our discussion on intestinal glucose absorption, and you'll notice that the sodium potassium pump in that example was indeed on the basolateral membrane. Epithelial cells have this tendency to kind of pack together, whether it's into sh uh, thick or thin sheets, kind of depends, but they have this tendency to pack together. So we want those neighboring epithelia to all have a solid connection to one another so that, again, like I was saying, you don't want them kind of floating away or getting pulled away from each other because that is going to disrupt the integrity of the entire sheet of epithelia. So we connect epithelial cells to each other via what are called junction proteins. And the location of these junction proteins also plays a big role in establishing the cell polarity to make sure that the apical membrane has certain membrane proteins that give it a particular uh, set of functions and keeps those functions distinct from the basolateral membrane. So these junction proteins will serve a variety of functions and their presence or absence in particular types of epithelial cells will just kind of depend on what type of organ or tissue that we are talking about. So for example, the epithelia that make up the lungs are going to have different properties and different proteins, different cell junctions than say the epithelia that make up the skin. So one of the most important types of junction proteins is called a tight junction. We can find these in a number of different places, namely places like the GI tract and the blood-brain barrier. So tight junctions we will have a discussion on uh, several times throughout the semester, but basically what tight junctions do is they seal up the gaps in between neighboring epithelial cells. So. Uh, yeah, that picture there's okay, but let's, uh, for our discussion on tight junctions, let's go backwards just a little bit. So you'll notice in this picture that we've got these three visible epithelial cells that are lined up right next to each other. So for a process like glucose absorption that we talked about in chapter three, we talked about the idea that glucose, if it's going to get absorbed from the lumen of the intestine up here, all the way down into the bloodstream down here, it would have to cross two different uh, membranes. It has to cross the apical membrane up here to get into the epithelial cell, and then it has to cross the basolateral membrane down here. Well, if it was not for these tight junctions, that would not be necessary. What these tight junctions do is it prevents a type of cell transport called paracellular transport, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So paracellular transport basically allows a solute to kind of cheat the system. Rather than having to move across a membrane, it just goes in between the space that exists between two neighboring cells. What a tight junction essentially is, is it's like a staple that links those two membranes together and prevents a molecule's attempt to kind of sneak in between the space in between the two cells. So it sounds like kind of a rough deal for us because if it wasn't for these tight junctions, we could absorb all the nutrients from our food without having to waste energy on these transport processes. But think about some other stuff that gets into our food that we would not freely passing through this layer of epithelia to get into our blood. Every single piece of food you have ever eaten has contained bacteria. Sorry to break the news to you like that, but it's true. Those bacteria, we do not want getting into our blood. We would get extremely, extremely sick if that were the case. So the tight junctions in that sense are very good because 
we have these transport processes to allow us to absorb our nutrients, to absorb water from the water that we drink, while also keeping those harmful microorganisms contained within the lumen, and they're never able to cross that layer of epithelia to get into the blood. And we owe all that to our tight junctions. Another type of cell-to-cell -cell junction is called a gap junction. We mentioned that gap junctions are the major component of intercalated discs in cardiac muscle tissue. You also find them in smooth muscle. Basically, a gap junction is like a little tunnel that connects the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of another. So like a tight junction, it is this big a conglomeration of proteins that goes through the plasma membrane of two different cells, but this one actually provides a functional connection. So very small ions like sodium and potassium can freely flow from the intracellular fluid of one cell to the intracellular fluid of the next door neighbor cell, provided those cells are connected by a gap junction. And then anchoring junctions, most epithelia are going to have these. Basically, these don't necessarily have a, well, I'm not going to say they don't have a purpose, but they don't have kind of a functional role in terms of like what tight junctions and gap junctions do. They're basically just there to kind of anchor the epithelia down and to give them some elasticity and strength and resistance. So I already mentioned how tight junctions prevent paracellular transport and allow the epithelia to act as a selective barrier. So we can get things like glucose and amino acids and water across the membrane of the intestines because we have actual carrier and channel proteins for those. Whereas bacteria can't get across because the tight junctions seal the gaps up and we can't get that paracellular transport. Gap junctions, like I said, connect the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of another. So again, you can kind of think of these as little tunnels that go through what otherwise is a fairly impenetrable barrier for certain things. Anchoring junctions that we're talking about come in several different forms. They're called adherence junctions, desmosomes, and hemidesmosomes. We're not really going to get into the details of them. We will rarely talk about them this semester. But like I was saying, they just kind of anchor the cell down and give it some structural integrity by linking the cytoskeleton of one cell to the cytoskeleton of another. So it's kind of giving each cell a little bit of extra rigidity and protection. So another th important thing that we want to be able to do is classify different types of epithelial cells. And we can classify epithelia based on two different criteria. And this is actually fairly simple in terms of being able to do. So you should be able to be kind of an expert at this after just a little bit of practice. So the first thing that we're going to consider is the ratio of the cell's length versus its width. And based on having three different ways to do this, we can come up with three different ways to classify. We can have cuboidal epithelia, squamous epithelia, and columnar epithelia. So if you think about a cell, think about its length and its width. So imagine taking a cell and stretching it out as long as you possibly can. What you have there is a cell that is very long, but it has become less and less wide. Well, if you have a cell like that that is much longer than it is wide, we call that a columnar cell. The best way to kind of remember that is if you think of a column, so columnar contains the word column, a column is a structure that is very much longer than it is wide. If uh, a cell has an equal length and width, meaning it looks like a little cube, we call it a cuboidal cell. The word cuboidal contains the root of the word cube, so that one's easy to remember as well. And then the only one that is left over is if you imagine squishing a cell so it's kind of flat as a pancake, that cell is going to be much wider than it is long, or much wider than it is tall, if you prefer. So that is a squamous cell. Cuboidal cells are have an equal length and width, Columnar is taller or longer than it is wide, and squamous is wider than it is tall or long. The other way we can classify epithelia is based on how many layers do we have, and this one's pretty simple. Uh, no pun intended, right? So simple epithelia is just one layer of cells, and we'll have a picture to look at here in a second for you to get the idea. If a 
layer of epithelia is more than one cell thick, then we call it stratified epithelia. So here's some pictures to kind of give you the idea. So let's look at this leftmost column here under the heading simple. Squamous epithelia, you'll notice, are wider than they are tall. Cuboidal cells look like little cubes, and columnar cells are much taller than they are wide. These are all simple epithelia because each layer is only one cell thick. So one cell, one cell, one cell, and one cell. We can have the same for each of them in stratified form. So you'll notice we have a layer of stratified squamous epithelia. Each one of the cells is wider than it is tall, but the whole layer of epithelia is, it looks like, about three or four cells thick. For the cuboidal layer here, it is two cells thick. For the columnar layer, again, it is two cells thick. Now, you have to be kind of careful with columnar epithelia because when you're looking under the microscope, generally the way you determine whether you're dealing with simple or stratified uh, epithelia is by looking at the position of the nuclei. So you'll notice here in the stratified columnar epithelia, we see a top layer of nuclei and a bottom layer of nuclei. When you're looking at cells under the microscope, you're gonna have a much easier time seeing the nuclei than you are seeing the cell's border. So if you imagine looking under the microscope and all you can see are the nuclei, you would see a top layer and a bottom layer, and you would conclude, rightfully so, that this is stratified epithelia. But if you look at this picture on the bottom right, you might get a little confused. You see some nuclei are kind of on top and some of them are on bottom. So you might kind of fool yourself into thinking you're dealing with stratified epithelia based on the position of the nuclei, but what you're dealing with here is actually more of a simple layer of epithelia that just have cells with kind of unique shapes that kind of push the nuclei kind of to different ends of the cells. So we call these pseudostratified, in which it is in reality a simple layer of epithelia, but it kind of looks like it is stratified. So why do we care about the distinction between simple versus stratified, cuboidal versus squamous versus columnar? So if we're talking about some of those cell transport processes that we talked about in chapter three, one of the things that we very much care about is the surface area of the cell membrane because the higher the surface area, the more room there is for transport processes to, to occur. So if you go back here, the, the idea here is that the flatter the cell is, the more membrane is exposed to the outside, meaning the squamous epithelia are going to have the highest surface area and the columnar is going to have the lowest. So if you are talking about having a layer of epithelia that is specialized for transport processes, you're probably going to want squamous epithelia and you're probably not going to want columnar epithelia. So columnar epithelia are probably going to be located in places where you're not really dealing with a lot of transport processes. As for the distinction between simple and stratified epithelia, this one is actually pretty simple. If you're dealing with a cell transport process like the movement of oxygen or carbon dioxide, transporting glucose or sodium or potassium, you want to consider how many membranes would have to be crossed for it to get from a luminal side to a basolateral side. If you have a simple layer of epithelia, it's only two. You have to cross the apical membrane and the basolateral membrane. When you're dealing with stratified epithelia, every additional layer creates two more barriers that have to be crossed. So if you say had glucose up here, it would have to cross this apical membrane, then this basolateral, then this apical, and then this basolateral. And every additional layer creates two new membranes that have to be crossed. And all that's going to do is slow down the transport process. So if you're in the business of having membrane transport processes happen as quickly and efficiently as possible, you want to have simple epithelia. So it's for this reason that stratified epithelia are not really there to mediate transport processes. They are there for providing kind of layers of protection. So you kind of have to look out for epithelia and you have to make some judgment calls on what is this epithelia probably there for based on how I am classifying it. So like I was saying, stratified epithelia have multiple layers and are therefore better suited for protection and barrier formation.
Another thing that is worth mentioning, not that we're going to see too terribly many examples of it, but epithelia are not usually homogenous in the sense that if you have a layer of epithelia, not every single cell in the layer is going to be exactly identical in terms of what they look like and what they do. Layers of epithelia tend to have a few specialized cells kind of interspersed throughout. A perfectly good example of this are what are called goblet cells, types of secretory cells that we see both in the respiratory tract and in the intestines. So a goblet cell is a type of mucus secreting cell. You can look at this cell here, you can see the nucleus at the bottom, and you can see a whole lot of secretory vesicles that contain a synthesized protein called mucin. Mucin accumulates a lot of water in these transport vesicles, and this goblet cell is going to release these vesicles by exocytosis into either the respiratory tract or into the intestinal tract so that we can lubricate those places and aid in certain transport processes. So a goblet cell, by all uh, measures, doesn't really look or function like a lot of other epithelia, but you will find it in a layer with a bunch of other epithelia. So back in chapter three, kind of going off of what we just said about a goblet cell synthesizing a protein, packaging it into a transport vesicle, and then releasing it into the extracellular space by exocytosis, we covered all that back in chapter three. We talked about protein and lipid synthesis in the ER and how we secrete these products into the extracellular space. So cells in the body use this method to export important products into the extracellular fluid or into the lumen of various organs. So the pancreas secretes digestive enzymes into the digestive tract so that we can break down a lot of those hard to break down food molecules. So glands that are made up of epithelia like this come in two major varieties. Exocrine glands use specialized secretory cells to secrete their product to an epithelial surface. So uh, the mammary glands, we're talking about breast milk. The pancreas is digestive enzymes, sweat glands and sweat. So whatever the product is that is being secreted via exocytosis, it goes onto an outside surface or a luminal surface. Whereas endocrine glands, which we'll be talking about in a few weeks, Endocrine glands secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. So we're kind of talking about the same sort of difference between epithelia and endothelia. So if exocrine glands secrete onto an epithelial surface, endocrine glands would secrete into an endothelial surface, meaning the blood vessels and the bloodstream. And when we get to chapter 17, which will be here before too much longer, we'll talk all about the different types of hormones, how they're made, how they're secreted, and what they do to modify homeostatic functions elsewhere in the body. So one of the last things that we'll talk about here are three different methods of secretion. Now, granted, this isn't the most crucial topic for us to cover here, but we might as well at least mention it. So you don't wanna necessarily think that every type of secretion is exactly the same. Now, most types of secretions are what we call marocrine secretion. Basically, this is kind of what we studied in chapter three. Transport vesicles are stored up at the apical surface and then released directly via exocytosis. So that's kind of what we've dealt with so far. Apocrine mechanism, which you'll see in the breasts and the sweat glands, Actually, rather than releasing your product via exocytosis, the cell actually pinches off a portion of the apical membrane and then releases the whole thing. So for especially for the sweat glands, because you are not just releasing a protein, but you're releasing a lot of different things contained within that cellular material, bacteria love this. They love to kind of feed on that material, which is why when you sweat and you release your product via those exocrine sweat glands, you kind of end up with something like body odor because the bacteria love that stuff and feed on that, and which is why uh, if you work out and sweat a bunch and then you don't take a shower right after, you're gonna probably smell like death, right? And then finally, the last method is holocrine secretion. So this is kind of an extreme form of secretion. So not only do, in apocrine, not only does it 
pinch off a part of the cell with holocrine, we basically sacrifice the whole cell to release the material that is contained within. So you basically kill off a whole cell just for the sake of releasing the product contained within that cell. So holocrine secretion will only be prominent in places in which there are plenty of stem cells available to replace the cells that were lost. So that kind of helps us to make a connection to the last topic that we covered in chapter three. All right, so that is going to do it for this video on epithelial cells. We only have one more section to go here in which we will discuss connective tissue. This will be another more lengthy discussion because as we're going to find out, there is no shortage of different types of connective tissue. I will go ahead and sign off for now. See you next time. Bye-bye.